Hey guys, Coach Pop here. Thanks for joining me for this week's video lecture. Today we're looking at Strayer's Chapter 18, Colonial Encounters in Asia and Africa, 1750 to 1950. As I noted in the podcast, the uh, there are certain developments that extend into the middle of the 20th century in this chapter. And again, it's a very long chapter. Uh, there's a reason why I guess it's called the long 19th century. Um, and so let's get started on this one. Whereas European exploration and mercantilist policies fueled Western colonialism in the early modern period, colonialism in the modern era was very closely linked to the process of industrialization. Consequently, many historians, but not Strayer, use the term neocolonialism to distinguish the features of 19th century colonialism. Let's take a closer look at some of these features. As the British and other European economies began to specialize in industrial production, they had an increased demand for specific raw materials from the tropical world, such as metals, oils, cotton, and rubber. Their growing populations also required new sources of food. Colonies would serve as captive and cheap sources of these commodities. Conversely, colonies would be captive markets for European exports, such as British cotton textiles. Indeed, when the British began importing mass-produced cotton textiles to India, they reversed a centuries-long trade imbalance. A previously poor Europe had been desirous of Asian goods with little to offer in return. As Western industrialization in the 19th century was closely tied to a new and expanding phase of capitalism, colonies naturally served as sources for investment. Indeed, many capitalists began to see a greater return on investment in overseas colonies than in domestic enterprises. With the rise of nationalism in Europe, average citizens suddenly felt they had a personal stake in their nation's imperial expansion. Viewing the struggles of European empires in Africa and Asia as a great game, they felt national pride in acquiring more territories and hated seeing territory go to a rival empire. Technological advances made new imperial expansions possible. Faster steamships, better guns, and global communication networks gave Europeans a marked tactical advantage over pre-industrial societies. Moreover, medical developments, such as using quinine to prevent and treat malaria, allowed the fragile European body to enter and survive in the tropics. For many Europeans, technological superiority indicated some sort of larger racial superiority. This is ironic, of course, because for most of human history, Europe was technologically and economically behind. Nonetheless, a variety of pseudoscientific theories were developed to explain the power differential between the industrial West and the pre-industrial world. The most notorious of these theories hijacked the work of Charles Darwin to create a justification for racism. Social Darwinism framed the conflict between white nations and people of color in terms of an evolutionary struggle for the survival of the fittest. In this view, European domination simply confirmed the racial superiority of white people. I want to go off script here for a moment. The uses and abuses of social Darwin Darwinism are still in effect in our society today. On the one hand, social Darwin Darwinism continues to be used by uh, certain white supremacist groups to justify their racism. On the other hand, social Darwinism is viewed negatively and is frequently used as a uh, reason to cast Darwin's theory of evolution into doubt by certain uh, groups. Darwin himself did not have any role in social Darwinism. In fact, the whole idea is very much a corruption of his understanding of evolutionary processes. So um, I just want to point out that, that lumping Darwin and his idea of uh, um, the origin of species into what became social Darwinism is really not uh, fair at all. Just as many historians use the phrase neocolonialism to distinguish 19th century developments from those before them, so too do many historians use the phrase new imperialism to distinguish modern maritime empires from those in the early modern period. The first wave of European maritime imperialism focused on the Americas, beginning with the Iberians and followed by the English, French, and Dutch. In the second wave, new European nations like Germany, Belgium, and Italy, and non-European nations like the United States and Japan joined the competition to annex lands in Asia, Africa, and Oceania. 
As has always been the case, military power was central to this second wave of imperial expansion. Thanks to industrialization, however, Europeans now enjoyed an enormous technological advan advantage using weapons such as the Maxim machine gun with devastating efficiency against lightly armed Africans and Asians. In the subcontinent of South Asia and the islands of Southeast Asia, the old East India companies continued a slow but steady expansion of territory through the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Millions of Asians in vast stretches of land were brought under the control of the British Raj and the Dutch East Indies. In Africa, a different process unfolded. Fueled by intense national rivalries and competition, European powers laid claim to territories before invading. Unable to understand European motives and techniques, most African kingdoms were completely overwhelmed. With few exceptions, the scramble for Af Africa was sudden and devastating. In Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, and other Pacific islands, isolated populations were invaded by white settlers from Europe and America who brought guns and germs. Within just a few generations, the remaining Aboriginal, Maori, and Polynesian peoples became impoverished and displaced minorities in their own lands. The United States and the Russian Empire both engaged in new expansion across vast stretches of continental land, displacing indigenous Native Americans and Central Asians or Siberians, respectively. The United States would also expand into the Caribbean and the Pacific Ocean, seizing Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines as a result of the Spanish-American War. In East Asia, a newly industrialized Japan flexed its muscle by annexing the Korean Peninsula and the island of Formosa, now called Taiwan, from China, and the islands of Sakhalin from Russia. Japan then engaged in a style of colonialism similar to the European examples. There were two notable cases of successful re resistance to the new imperialism. The first was the East African nation of Ethiopia, which defeated Italy at the 1896 Battle of Adawa. The second was Siam, presently Thailand, which used diplomacy and accommodation to avoid imperial annexation. If you look at this particular map of uh, Europeans in Asia, you'll note uh, the British in the Indian subcontinent, it's a continent much larger than today's India, the Dutch in Indonesia, the French here, the United States now controls the Philippines, but also note uh, Japan right here is expanding territory uh, here on the Korean Peninsula, up here taking this from Russia. Uh, you can see Russia is expanding, of course, the Trans-Siberian Railroad connecting uh, the in inland area of Russia all the way to the Sea of Japan. Um, and note as well that there's this little tiny independent Siam that is uh, not part of any of the European uh, empires at the time. And as well, China is kind of uh, surrounded by uh, imperial powers who are looking for ways to expand their territory. In Africa, the situation was a little different because European powers uh, divided up before they actually get in there. And uh, in many cases, they don't even know what is there when they uh, are uh, carving it up. Two things I want to point out right now. The French tend to dominate most of West Africa, and the British, you'll notice, have this sort of north-south line in East Africa. We're going to discuss those more in class. And then um, Ethiopia, the time called Abyssinia, is uh, one of the few examples of uh, Africans uh, resisting imperialism, in, in this case uh, with Italy. Uh, Liberia is also not a uh, colony of a European country for a slightly different reason, but that's something we'll go over in class. The speed and efficiency of the European new imperialism was often traumatic for the colonized peoples of Africa and Asia. The dramatic loss of life, property, and tradition prompted a range of responses, not just from the colonized, but also the colonizers. With relatively few Europeans living in their tropical colonies, these empires depended on various groups of native collaborators who expected some form of reward for their cooperation. However, because they were a vast minority, Europeans lived under a constant threat of rebellion. 
Soldiers were often recruited from groups deemed to be martial races and were used to expand territory and put down revolts. Various local rulers from Indian Rajas to African chiefs helped Europeans exercise indirect power over colonial societies, and the colonial bureaucracy increasingly used native clerks as in its lower administration. An essential but often frustrated segment of society was the small percentage of natives who attained a Western education. While they were much needed to run the colonies, they were viewed with suspicion and disdain by both the colonizers, who viewed them as a potential threat, and the colonized, who viewed them as traitors to their own people. Colonial rule was characterized by, a, by numerous revolts, both small and large, but one of the most important began in 1857, when large numbers of sepoys, who were Indian troops fighting for the British, mutinied. The revolt was brutally crushed within a year, but bitter memories remained, and the British hardened racial boundaries between colonizer and colonized. While empires had always relied on cooperation, the most notable features of neocolonialism, as distinct from earlier forms of col colonialism, can be seen in several new developments among the European colonizers. Unlike earlier forms of col uh, colonialism, neocolonialism used scientific racism to justify the firm racial barriers between the colonizers and the colonized. In settler colonies with larger populations of whites, elaborate systems were developed to institutionalize race, racial separation while also ensuring access to cheap native labor in mines and farms. In South Africa, this eventually evolved into the system known as apartheid. Unlike previous forms of colonialism, there was a much more profound impact on the daily life of the colonized subjects. More efficient means of tax collecting, transportation, and communication, as well as more invasive changes to landowning, economic systems, administration, and public health, meant that the foreign presence was felt much stronger than in earlier forms of empire. In an effort to understand and to control their colonized peoples, neocolonial empires developed systems and sciences such as anthropology to study, classify, and organize colonial societies. This process served to create an idealized version of the society in question and condemn all other variations. In India, the result was the creation of a singular understanding of India as a classical and unchanging society structured by one type of Hinduism and the caste system. Despite India's long tradition of religious diversity, any variations or adaptations were scorned as inauthentic. A similar process occurred in Africa. Despite its many empires, kingdoms, and city-states, Europeans viewed Africa as a collection of barbaric tribes ruled by simple chiefdoms. This condescension allowed them to pursue divide-and-rule tactics, which pitted tribe against tribe. This era also saw a great importance placed upon gender. White men were to be virile and hi hi hyper-masculine, while colonized men were typically effeminized unless they fit into the useful category of a martial race. Moreover, white women were placed on a pedestal and had to be protected from the assumed sexual threat of black and brown men. Even as many European nations were becoming increasingly democratic at home, they ruled their colonies as dictatorships. They were also unwilling to modernize their colonies and risk destabilizing the societies they governed. Hence, they preferred tribal, traditional, and rural communities. The result was a sharp contrast between political ideals at home and in the colonies. The global economic impact of neocolonialism cannot be overstated, but the most dramatic change for most people in African and Asian colonies was in the ways of working. While there was no coherent labor strategy employed by the colonizers, several patterns did emerge. Despite the fact that the abolitionist movement was sweeping across the Atlantic world, European colonial states continued to find ways to force workers to labor without pay. For example, French and British colonies regularly required the native population to supply free labor for road and rail building projects. While not technically slavery, this labor tax forced workers to labor in dangerous conditions with no pay, and it fostered a great deal of resentment among the colonized. The Belgian Congo was the worst case of forced labor and cost millions of African lives. 
State-backed private companies used a variety of abusive tactics, including mutilation, to force the local population to collect ivory and rubber. Eventually, the abuses became public, and the Belgian government took control of the colony in 1908. In Indonesia, the Netherlands forced peasants to devote 20% of their land to cash crops such as coffee and sugar and to sell them at a low fixed price to government contractors. The Dutch made huge profits reselling these crops on the global market, but the system indebted many peasants and resulted in a series of famines in otherwise productive land. Not all attempts to coerce free labor succeeded, however. In German East Africa and Portuguese Mozambique, the colonial state tried to force the native populations to cultivate cotton, but both projects met with widespread resistance and neither succeeded despite the heavy use of violent force. In many colonies, there were centuries-old systems of cash cropping that the colonial state sought to encourage with expanding markets, public works, and labor migration. In other colonies, new cash crops were introduced. In some colonies, food crops were expanded and transformed into cash crops for export, but with mixed results. On the one hand, British Burma saw several decades of a rising standard of living as the lower Irrawaddy became a major rice ex exporter thanks to public works and immigration. On the other hand, in French Vietnam, the expansion of rice fields in the Mekong Del Delta had a negative impact on various fish and shellfish and hurt the local diet. In other colonies, market forces determined the cash crops cultivated. Global demand pushed the expansion of tobacco and coffee production in East Africa and Indonesia, while British demand for tea spurred production in India. The British also began cultivating opium in India for export to a new market in China, a development we will learn about in the next chapter. In another unusual development, peasant farmers on the Gold Coast took, took the initiative and expanded their production of cacao to meet the market demand for chocolate. By 1911, Ghana was the world's leading supplier. However, a labor shortage created social strife and exacerbated ethnic tensions, devastating this hybrid peasant capitalist enterprise. The establishment of European-run enterprises in the colonies created large movements of laborers in search of employment as wage laborers, both within and among the colonies themselves, but also from China and Japan. In rural areas, perhaps after losing their land or facing heavy taxes or loans, workers would often leave their homes for work in mines, plantations, or construction sites in the cities. Others might try to earn a living as servants or clerks. Life for the lower rungs of colonial society in the mines, plantations, and cities were difficult with low wages and often brutal managers. Filling the labor void after the end of slavery, some 29 million Indians left their homeland to work as plantation laborers and miners in other British colonies from East Africa to Jamaica. A smaller wave of South Asians made a living as merchants, especially in British East Africa. Moreover, some 19 million Chinese sought a new life in Southeast Asia, the Indian Ocean Basin, and the Pacific region. Indeed, Malaysian rubber plantations and tin mines were staffed primarily with Chinese workers. In colonies with significant white settler communities such as Algeria, South Africa, and the Kenyan Highlands, Local populations were frequently pushed off their land as the colonial state gave vast tracts of real estate to Europeans. Many of these natives were directed toward reservation-style settlements where they could seek out work on European farms or mines. Others tried to stay on their land but were viewed as squatters and not given full protection of the law. While there was much variation in the colonial economies of Africa, some patterns can be discerned. Frequently, men would turn to growing more prestigious cash crops for the market, leaving women to handle subsistence food production. In many cases, husbands would migrate to mine cities or farms for work, often separated from their wives and children for lengthy periods. Without the male head of the household, many women assumed that role, giving them newfound agency and some degree of independence. There remains much debate on the role of colonialism in the world's economic development. Defenders argue that it set key processes in motion, 
while critics point to exploitation and uneven development. Despite the debates, three points remain clear. For better or worse, neocolonialism did speed up global economic integration, as many previously isolated areas of Africa and Asia were now plugged into a growing trend toward globalization. What's more, various degrees of modernity did trickle into the colonies, including bureaucratic and administrative techniques, communication and transportation infrastructure, and the establishment of hospitals and schools. However, perhaps most significantly, no colony developed a complete industrial transformation the way Japan did, for example. This would have dramatic consequences in the post-colonial era, era of the 20th century. Neocolonialism not only transformed the economies of their respective colonies, but they also transformed their cultures. Indeed, disruptions to traditional lifeways challenged the way the colonized viewed themselves and their communities. For a very small but important minority, a Western-style education became the basis for a changing personal and cultural identity. Western education provided a variety of new opportunities and privileges for those who were lucky enough to receive schooling. Wealth, employment, and a higher social status came with literacy in the colonizer's language. Many educated elite adopted various aspects of European culture, including dress, speech, marriage ceremonies, and housing. Some saw collaboration with the Europeans as a path toward modernity for their respective societies. Unfortunately, however, many willing colonial collaborators found that Europeans would not treat them as equals. Racism and a condescending view of native culture as primitive and backwards ensured that they were never equal partners. As with education, religion also challenged traditional identities among the colonized. Unlike education, however, the conversion to Christianity effect, affected more than just a privileged few. In New Zealand and other Pacific islands, and in non-Muslim Africa, Christian missionaries made dramatic gains with large-scale conversions. In Africa, 50 million people identified as Christians in the 1960s. However, in many places, syncretism between the new faith and traditional beliefs and practices alarmed the Christian colonizers. Indeed, conversion to Christianity was not without its cultural conflicts. Debates over gender roles, sexual practice, and traditions such as female circumcision produced serious disputes. Missionaries were concerned about Christians who practiced pagan and tribal traditions and saw them as backsliders. In India, the British were overwhelmed by the varieties of religious practice and sought to establish a clear and codified definition of the local faiths as a single religion. The scholars and missionaries who studied South Asian religion promoted the idea of an orthodox form of Hinduism. Some Indians adopted this definition of theory and ritual as a way of reforming their faith. In India, too, the British also inadvertently helped to forge a sense of Muslim, of Muslim unity excuse me, by establishing two laws of inheritance, one for Hindus and one for Muslims, the colonial state put the diverse Muslim community into a situation of self-identifying as Muslim. Furthermore, as early nationalists began to speak of India as a Hindu nation, some Muslims felt defensive about their minority status. This set in motion a process that would go, grow throughout the 20th century. Neocolonialism in Africa had an enormous impact on how people identified themselves. Some began to, to self-identify with larger groups, other with smaller ones. Prior to the scramble of Africa, few people saw themselves as Africans. Rather, they were part of a village, a kinship group, a language group, a city, a kingdom, or an empire. Yet the shared experience of European colonialism and racism led some to see themselves as part of a larger continental community. With colonial systems of transportation, Africans and those of African descent in the Americas came into contact with each other. Some, such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey, argued for a pan-African identity that transcended the white boundaries of colony and nation-state. As the Europeans conquered the continent, they found linguistic and material similarities between various communities, leading them to define and group them as tribes. 
While often a European creation, many African communities adopted the tribal identity as their own and used it as a communal identity. Thank you for joining me for this rather lengthy uh, presentation of Chapter 18. I hope you were able to fill in all the blanks, and I will see you in class.